have dyspraxia, are being mislabeled at school as lazy or naughty. That's according to a charity. Dyspraxia is a condition which is thought to affect as many as two children in every class or as much as 5% of the population. Yet, it receives a fraction of the publicity of less common disorders such as dyslexia or autism. It's a lifelong neurological condition that slows the transmission of messages from the brain to the limbs. People who have it can have difficulty with coordination and movement, but also with processing information. The Dyspraxia Foundation believes that tens of thousands of children and adults are unaware they have it. There's no cure, but early diagnosis can help teachers be more supportive. Well, we can now speak to Sally Payne, a trustee of the Dyspraxia Foundation. She's also an NHS occupational therapist who carried out her PhD research on dyspraxia in teens. Rosalind van der Weer and 10-year-old Ruben and Sarah Greaves and 7-year-old Lucas and Ruben have both been diagnosed with dyspraxia. Mark Robinson is a former One Extra DJ who was only diagnosed with dyspraxia two years ago at the age of 40. He's gone back into education and is studying to be a barrister. Welcome to the programme. Sally, I'm going to come to you first of all, just to tell us a bit more about what dyspraxia is and more about what the symptoms are. Mm. So dyspraxia is a condition that affects large body movements, uh, such as balance, posture, the ability to catch and, and kick a ball, and also the fine motor movements, so the way that we use our hands to grip, manipulate um, and handle tools and equipment. It can also affect speech in some people and... Um, there are also difficulties often with organisation, planning, attention, memory, and these difficulties combined can make it really difficult for people to carry out the everyday activities that, that the rest of us take for granted. It might be unhelpful, but it's also been called, described by some as dyslexia for movement. Mm. I think there's a, a, a general understanding or awareness of, of dyslexia, but I think uh, dyspraxia is very different in that it affects the organisation of movement and also uh, the planning and retention difficulties too. How does dyspraxia affect Ruben? Well, Ruben, do you want to answer that? Um, it took me quite long to learn to swim and ride bike and um, everyone in my class could tie their shoelaces and I it took me a lot longer to learn to tie my shoelaces and the teachers would get quite annoyed because they would do have to do my shoelaces and I wouldn't be able to do them. And then now they now I've been diagnosed with dyspraxia, they sort of understand more and they get it they they understand that I have a reason that I don't and must have been pretty difficult though not knowing why you can't do things yeah. which to other people seem easy mm. how did you feel it was embarrassing because everyone else could do it and i just i i couldn't and it was just annoying and embarrassing when was uh, reuben diagnosed what, what led to that well to be honest it was actually um a school report so um Obviously, I've got a daughter who's a little bit older um, and just a year older and who'd sort of flown through school and then had the same teacher when we moved into the same class. And the teacher was quite sort of astonished at the difference between the two children. And I think, well, Reuben's just my, just my Reuben. And um, but when we had the school report back, it had said the word, I think, was it distracted? At least five, five or six times. And I thought, you know, and that was chipping away at his sort of self-esteem. And I thought, well, that's he's trying really hard. And you're how old, Ruben? Ten. I'm ten. ten yeah. yeah. And when did you get that report? Um, uh, I was about eight. Eight. Okay. So a few mm. years ago. Yes, and that's made a real difference, hasn't it? Yeah. And to your teacher as well. Mm. Had you heard of the term dyspraxia before that? I, I had, um, just from a professional perspective. I've worked in health uh, as an occupational therapist, like Sally. Um, so I had some inside knowledge about it, um, but I think it's still very different when it's your own child, um, you know, managing all of those sorts of issues, thinking, is it because Ruben's, because he's a boy, boys take, often take a little bit longer, um, should he be trying harder? And it's trying to always judge that balance all the time. And I'll come, I'll come to you in a second, Lucas, but before we do, it does, does it, well, you tell me, does it affect males more than it does females? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, the research suggests about three boys to every 
every one girl is affected. And, and I think um, some research that the Dyspraxia Foundation carried out a couple of years ago suggested that girls were later, um, typically later, when their, their difficulties were identified. Lucas, how does dyspraxia affect you? It doesn't really affect me. It just, it just took me longer to ride my bike and like tie my shoelaces. And like, it, it just took me longer at other things than other people. Like, I just got like a bit bad at handwriting than everybody else. So like, and what was that like for you? Was that difficult? Yeah, it was com it was quite confusing and embarrassing when I did it. and I would only get about half of what they got and the teachers would get really annoyed at me and they would they'd just be quite frustrated because I hadn't got much work done and because at the time they didn't like know. And how did you feel with when that happened? I, it was really frustrating because, well I didn't know at the time either but it was just really annoying because they weren't really they just thought i was stupid and not very which certainly isn't the case it, yeah it's absolutely not the case let me bring in mark now at this point um, um, how do you feel listening to lucas and ruben because you were diagnosed at 40. yes i mean it brings back a lot of stuff i suffered through my childhood um yeah i had a torrid time in school the shoelaces the, the lots of clumsy things <coughs> on to this day my handwriting is still pretty bad um, and it was um, something that in you know, playing sport I was often left out being able to do uh, um, football for example was really bad being the only child that couldn't play so it's um, 
for a time, but I've, I've made up for it at 40 for what I, I can't mean, do. I mean, what we're talking about, how difficult it was for both of you uh, before you found out, you had to go through such a big part of your life not knowing. H how difficult was that? I mean, completely d did my self-esteem, to be honest with you, in school. I was ridiculed, but I was bullied because of it. I was, I was um, called stupid by the teachers. I was in the bottom set, so in everything. And I, I, um, I only did an, um, a maths GCSE in school. And my whole life, I always wondered, what is it? What, what, why is it? And it was coordination. And um, it's only till someone told me, when I went for um, a dyslexia test, that it, it might be... Dyspraxia that actually looked into it further and got myself checked up, and then um, I was enabled, um, able to um, start university after that point. Great. And it's been a complete turnaround. How did you feel when you found at that moment when when you found that that moment when that explained everything that happened before school, not being able to tie your shoelaces, all the other symptoms? What was that moment like? Oh, I, I definitely relieved that I finally had an answer yeah. for it. It was a, a moment of vindication and. Um, being able to progress and find a solution of how I can now cope and get the support in place. I always, through my career in the music, I always felt that um, I was missing academically, and so I really felt the need to make up for it. And you have, and, you, and you're, what are you doing now? Right, so I'm, I attend Berkeley University, and I'm just finishing off my law degree, and I'm about to start my training contract as a solicitor with um, Emil Helio and, and Brown in East London, practicing criminal law. And the immigration, and it's literally from having not even a single GCSE to this, and all it was is just that support. And so I just urge people to please, if you if your children are displaying these kind of signs, please go and get that support. Don't suffer like I did. Do you know what I mean? Because you can, with that support, achieve to the highest level. That that's so good to hear. And talking about support, how much support is available? Also, given that people don't even know what dyspraxia is. Oh, I think just to, if you don't mind just taking it back just one step, mm -hmm. I think the key thing is knowledge is power, isn't mm -hmm. it? I think the more that you've got self-insight, then you can support yourself, seek the resources that you need um, to sort of help take yourself forward in life, and you can help inform others then, can't you? Because that was a turning point for your life, by the sound of it, no, getting that self-insight, and definitely for you, Ruben, wasn't it? And so we've used different things um, in terms of support checklists, those sorts of things, remembering everything to put in the school bag, things to, really practical stuff, what to bring home. Um, you, you encourage to do your mental checklist, aren't you? And Dyspraxia Foundation um, have got some fantastic leaflets that I really encourage everybody to, to have a look on their website. They've got um, top tips for children in early years, and then it goes on to the next level, um, tips for um, students and teachers at primary school, mm -hmm. um, and then on to secondary school. So, and they're down downloadable from the website. They're really slick. You can take them into school to give them to your teachers. Um, and they're fabulous. Uh, a little bit of feedback on, uh, on what people at home are, are, are watching and, and seeing. Julie on Twitter says, both boys are wonderful, very clear, confident, and will be great spokesmen for dyspraxia. George on Twitter says, an unbelievable performance from the two young lads on Victoria Live. Keep your chin up, boys, and don't let it hold you back. Uh, talking about support, the government has invested, I think it's about half a million pounds, to cover a few things, not just dyspraxia, uh, but is enough being done? What more can be done? I think, uh, as Rosalind says, the, the important thing is to raise awareness and understanding so that the, the difficulties of, of children like Reuben and Lucas can be recognised and identified in, in the classroom. Because if we have that recognition, then we can put in place the support strategies that will enable people to be successful, uh, like Mark and the other adults that, that we know um, who, who are doing amazing things in their lives. Mm -hmm. right, it sounds like you all are. Thank you very much for coming in and talking to us about this today. OK, well, a Department for Education spokesman, I can tell you exactly what they said. They told us that uh, we know how important it is that children with medical conditions are supported to enjoy a full education. That's why we introduced a new duty to require governing bodies to make arrangements to support pupils with medical conditions and to have provided statutory guidance outlining schools' responsibilities in this area. Like I said, they say they are providing half a million pounds to the British Dyslexia Association in partnership with Helen Arkell Dyslexia Centre, Patos, the Dyspraxia Foundation and Manchester Metropolitan University to provide support for children and young people with dyspraxia, dyslexia and other specific learning 
difficulties. President Trump